Welcome to the Bitcoin Source Podcast, ladies and gentlemen. Today, we have an incredible guest with us, JP Barrick, the founder and CEO of Mining Store. With his vast experience in Bitcoin mining and operating large-scale mining operation data centers, JP brings a wealth of knowledge to our discussion about Bitcoin. Let's delve into some interesting questions. Welcome, JP. Thanks for having me. I'm here. excited to be here today. Yes, likewise, likewise. So, uh, JP, you know, I usually ask people when they first get on the show, like, you know, what are some of the most important sources of knowledge that they've actually learned since adopting Bitcoin, whether it's books, courses, or even conferences? Um, so could you kind of like break down some books or things that helped orange pill you on your initial journey into Bitcoin? Sure. So for me, some of the earliest stuff I ever listened to was Andreas Antonopoulos. He does a great job explaining the value of Bitcoin, the value of the Bitcoin blockchain versus just why do you even use a blockchain? Um, Digital Gold is another great book about the early histories of, of people getting into Bitcoin, about the techno technology. And then I actually have another book suggestion I just recently read. You know, in my Bitcoin journey, I got in in 2013, so it's been a while, but it's called The Sovereign Individual. And it's another great book for Bitcoiners who want to see what this world's about when it comes to a global enterprise, a global society, um, and the idea of digital money and taxation. So for me, those are three great areas to learn more about Bitcoin and the overall ethos. But it is a constant journey. I mean, I remember days looking on Wikipedia like, you know, what is the uh, the Byzantine generals problem and like doing research on that or watching macro and microeconomics and energy because it's such an interesting topic that you can go down so many rabbit holes. But at the end of the day, Bitcoin's here to stay. And so it's worth spending your time on. The Sovereign Individual is definitely one of my favorite books. One of my new favorite books that have been added to the repertoire is The Mandibles. I don't know if you've ever read that one, but if you can get your hands on that. Yeah, uh, CK from Bitcoin Magazine, he really raves about it. That's how I found out about it. Um, you can get it on Amazon. It's called The Mandibles, and it's pretty much it breaks down, you know, a, a dystopian future where fiat currency is no longer available. It's like digital based, like kind of the stuff that we're possibly going to see in the future. But man, it's a good book. It's it's really well written. It's awesome book, especially for Bitcoiners. So, so JP, um, you know, I kind of want to start talking more about, you know, your initial innovation, your uh, your mining operation that you started. So as the CEO of Mining Store, you've been involved in cryptocurrency mining for quite some time. And, you know, how has you seen the mining landscape kind of evolve since you started? And what are some key factors that have contributed to its growth and increased adoption? So when I got into the mining space at scale was right around 20 I would say 16, 17, right when Ethereum was a couple of dollars and during the first mining phase of that. So we got 300 graphics cards, raised money from family, friends, and myself, put some capital in to buy these graphics cards from Newegg. And at that point, there were people starting to rent warehouses, starting to, we were in an old yarn facility where they made clothes and mining Bitcoin there where they had extra electrical power. And people started building out their own sites, but it wasn't anything to the dedication and the malith the monolithic scale we have today of riots, the 100 megawatt plus facilities where they're just massive and plopped right next to a, um, an energy source. So over time, when the capital became more available, as people start to say from 2013 or from 2017 to say, okay, Bitcoin's not going away, $20,000, let's invest some real capital into this space. And the run up between 20 and $60,000 saw massive amounts of capital deployed by public companies, private companies. Now we have sovereign wealth funds in mining. And so as we grow and grow and grow as an industry, it's only becoming more institutionalized, more professionalized, but still distributed. There's still people building five megawatt sites and two megawatt sites out there and running uh, enough miners where it is a full-time job for someone. And they're investing, let's say a few million dollars of capital versus the companies that are public or investing hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars of capital. And the nice thing about mining is once you hit a certain size and a certain scale, you don't have too much um, value with the scale. You're not going to save too much more money on every mined Bitcoin because you run into other costs like SG&A and, and other costs that just operate. At the end of the day, mining, the number one cost is our electricity. And really smaller operators sometimes can find cheaper, lower cost of electricity versus the really big guys. That's how it's, you know, the, the growth of the industry and um, and how I'm seeing it change in the future is just like, 
more hash rate, more power, and more integration now with the grid, demand response, turning off mining facilities when the power's prices are high and running when uh, the power prices are negative or low. Yeah, um, what I was going to say, JP, is um, I ha I've had some miners on, some people that are really well-versed in the space, but your particular endeavor is like kind of unique because I feel like you really started from the bottom up. And we know that, you know, Bitcoin, of course, requires this massive amount of energy um, to, con you know, computing power so it can harness this computing power. So, like, what steps has the mining store taken to uh, address some of these environmental concerns that people are so worried about with Bitcoin in some of your mining practices, if you could speak on that? Yeah, so I'll talk a little bit more about our history as well. And we, so I got into that 300 mining facility, 300 machine mining facility, then started going to the Dolls Oregon, went to uh, doing different projects with groups like the Sacramento Kings and our Mining for Good partnership. We're actually mining at the data center for charities. So that's another example of how mining is, you know, it can be good, used for good, um, donating the money that was, that's mined at that data center to Girls to Code and other organizations in the area. Then we had in a project we did at the Sacramento with, um, in bio, with Biostar Renewable in Temecula, California, where we helped a solar farm in a wilderness area connect to a, um, a data center or a Bitcoin mining container to get their tax credits. But when it comes to mining stores and what we do to, to help with the grid and with energy usage, now I believe Bitcoin in energy usage is a core fundamental value add or why it has value in the first place. So I think it is a feature set and feature add, but how does Bitcoin mining work with the grid? Well, as a flexible load, we're turning off when the price of energy is high, as I mentioned. That's the most time when the energy price is high. That's going to be when carbon-based fuel is being utilized to make energy on the grid. Because when you have solar and wind and hydropower, those energy assets can bid lower for the energy market. And so what happens in these energy markets is they have a day-ahead market where every generation asset bids into the market, and then a clearing price is set for every hour, or every 15 minutes of that market of when of how much the energy is going to cost. And so what we do as an operator is we say, we're not willing to pay above a certain price for that energy. We're just going to pay, let's say $80 a megawatt hour maximum. So when the energy is $100, $200, we're actually turned off giving the energy to someone else and not using it because I mentioned it's usually coal and natural gas at that time on the grid. When we're, when we are running, it's those negatively priced hours. It's those hours in the middle of the night, in the evening, in the, in the early morning when solar and wind are on the grid, but no one else is using or consuming the energy. And electricity is such a unique, um, commodity because you can't just store it. Yes, we have batteries, but it's nothing like storing barrels and, you know, tons of oil or all this natural gas. You can store that, put it away and use it when you're ready. Electricity needs to be used. And so for us as a consumer, having a flexible demand, as a consumer, helps build grid resiliency, helps lower prices of energy across the consumer base, and also helps increase utilization of fixed assets where those loans, they already exist. They're already going to the, the consumer. They're already being passed the rate payer. But by putting a large load at these substations that are not being fully utilized, we help increase the utilization and help the community out overall. Not a, let, let alone the jobs, the, the trucking that's happening, the electricians, the labor, um, all of that is supporting the local community um, and when it comes to high paying IT jobs in areas where they would not be otherwise. Yeah, most definitely. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that as far as the job sector, because I never forget, like I saw you on Dr. Phil and I remember like seeing how confused he was when you were kind of <laughs> explaining some of this Bitcoin jargon. I mean, of course, I'm a Bitcoiner, so I understand it, but I think it's really important for people to understand the benefits, the economic benefits of Bitcoin mining and rattling off some of those things you did as far as um, the labor jobs, the technology jobs, the trucking jobs. That's the bloodline of America, of the economics of America. So um, I'm really glad to hear you kind of elucidate on that because that's super important for people to know. It is important. And we're bringing these high tech IT jobs to rural America where young men mostly are able to come in, see this opportunity where they can go and get an IT career. They're getting training, they're taking courses, and then those IT jobs also are applicable at other places for them to work for a telecom provider, work with fiber, work with one of the bigger data centers like Microsoft, Facebook, because now they have a strong base uh, base level, skill level. So we're super excited and I'm really glad we have a great team in Iowa where most of our data centers are. and able to provide this opportunity to, to you know tens of people but in the future hopefully hundreds of young men as they go through their journey in that in the midwest um, thank you for that jp so jp i kind of want to switch gears and talk kind of about 
um, you know, the difficulty and the competition in the Bitcoin mining space. So, you know, what advice do you have to individuals or businesses that are looking to get into the mining industry? So my advice is make sure you understand that difficulty keeps going up even when price is going down. Make sure you understand that the number one factor to you succeeding is energy costs by far. If your energy cost is above five cents a kilowatt hour, it is very hard to be in a business where you can run miners effectively, especially during the bear markets. Also, don't bite off more than you can chew. It's okay to start with a small facility, but getting racking yourself with debt, you know, building out these larger facilities, not having expertise in running them. When you go from 100 miners to 1,000 miners, the amount of problems you have, it grows exponentially. You're now having to staff people, create HR, um, train people, build more systems and processes. So it's important to understand who, what you're, why are you getting into the mining business and are you looking to get exposure as a Bitcoin miner or are you looking just to provide a hosting experience for customers where they take the Bitcoin mining exposure? It's up to you to decide that, but I would say that Bitcoin mining, you make the most amount of money in a nine-month period. And that's when the bull market's running. No one else can deploy machines fast enough. And the value of a terahash is increasing rapidly. So timing is so important in the Bitcoin mining space, knowing when to deploy your capital, when to pull your capital out, and when to just run other people's facilities. That's how you can be a successful uh, Bitcoin miner over the long term. Don't buy machines if the, fl if the price of them is, you know, four, three, five times higher than what they retailed for previously. Don't 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 spend your money there because it's going to be a loss. Remember, Bitmain and these guys change the prices of miners based on the amount of Bitcoin they can extract over a two-year period and the value of that Bitcoin today. That doesn't mean that Bitcoin is going to be the same value two years from now. And so when you're building your models, you really have to ensure that you build for a 70 or 80% drawdown in price. And you have to make sure that, like I said, you're not building too much debt into your thing. You're not paying massive interest for the capital. It's better to start slow grow, scale, go through a few cycles. And that's how, what I would suggest for anyone new who's getting into Bitcoin mining. You know, your company mining store focuses on reducing that friction and increasing the financial access to the mining industry. And I think that you, along with a number of other different companies are doing this, but what makes you so unique in my personal opinion is that um, you're accessible. People can talk to you. Your company is very open to kind of showing people the mining process and what it's like to take on this endeavor. And um, you know, there's tons of opportunities in this mining space, especially when we talk about the energy, the gas, the oil sectors. They're massively understaffed right now. They're looking for innovation. They're looking for ways to change due to some of the climate change issues that we're seeing in the space right now. So I think Bitcoin mining is definitely like a win win. And I'm just hopeful that more people will actually get on board and focus on Bitcoin instead of some of the other um, distractions that you see in the energy, energy industry at the moment. And exactly. And, and my goal is coming out, being transparent, showing you guys what we're doing on the ground with TikTok videos, showing you the facilities, you know, getting on these podcasts, sharing our story, sharing the organization. And we're, we're looking to build the most transparent mining sales process and also one of the most intuitive mining sales processes so that people understand what's the risk, what they're getting into, and then what they should expect during the operation and during the mining full life cycle. Because it is a long and investment and people, you know, they don't know necessarily what they're getting into. And it's sad that most mining investors are coming in with an emotional charge and are doing it with an, a, a, like, now I want to do it because it's emotionally versus like, hey, the prices are pretty low right now. I've been timing this out. I'm educated. I'm ready to buy my machines when it's the best time in the market or dollar cost average into machines. And so we're working on educating people and, and getting them across the finish line. But sadly, you know, I can't help that people aren't interested when it's a good time to buy. And people are interested when it's like, well, the price is pretty high. I don't know how high it's going to go, but, you know, it's going to go going to go down eventually. Yes. And that, that kind of reminds me, too, like there have been other companies that have done this. And I think it's getting better now as the mining industry gets becomes more ubiquitous in the space. But, you know, there's been people that have been burnt by companies that, they'd be somewhere offshore in Iceland or Greenland or something. And they'll say like, hey, we can see your miner, we can show you everything, but you can't have a face-to-face -face conversation. And that's why I always love to talk to founders and CEOs of these mining companies, because we wanna show the industry that we're legit, we're real, and we are here to provide a service and a product to the masses. 
and that's Bitcoin. So yeah. And exactly. And, and my goal is coming out, being transparent, showing you guys what we're doing on the ground with TikTok videos, showing you the facilities, you know, getting on these podcasts, sharing our story, sharing the organization. And we're, we're looking to build the most transparent mining sales process and also one of the most intuitive mining sales process so that people understand what's the risk, what they're getting into, and then what they should expect during the operation and during the mining full life cycle. Cause it is a long and investment and people, you know, they don't know necessarily what they're getting into. And it's sad that most mining investors are coming in with an emotional charge and are doing it with an, um, like now I want to do it cause it's emotionally versus like, Hey, the prices are pretty low right now. I've been timing this out. I'm educated. I'm ready to buy my machines when it's the best time in the market or dollar cost average into machines. And so we're working on educating people and, and getting them across the finish line. But sadly, you know, I can't help that people aren't interested when it's a good time to buy and people are interested when it's like, well, the price is pretty high. I don't know how high it's going to go, but you know, it's going to go, going to go down eventually. Exactly. And you know, the best, the best innovation in the Bitcoin space is always built during the bear market. Right. So I think a lot of people just don't understand. They're waiting for the price to go up. But even for me with this podcast, I've done so many of my episodes or a bulk of my episodes during a downtrend, during when the price is, it's not bad. It's stable to people that don't know, but to the people that do know, this is a great price and this is a great opportunity to buy right now. And I think once companies allow better access to getting access to a miner, allowing people to see the process of what Bitcoin mining entails, and then they can actually make some profit from it. I think that that's going to open up the floodgates to get investors and people that want to buy into something like mining store to make it very lucrative for the for, for the ecosystem, for sure. And I'm excited to, for people to learn about it, for it to be easy and accessible. And it's getting there. And it's getting there. But the problem is with every business, you know, scaling quickly can be hard. And that's the one thing we like about these SPVs or these reg CFs are that when we are dealing with an influencer, that's one customer, but a thousand of his fans can join versus having a thousand customers and a thousand support tickets and having all these issues and returns and individual miners going back and forth. It's, it's so hectic because one way we're able to be profitable through a bear market is mining stores were very, very clear with, okay, we build five megawatts. That means we hire this many staff and we're going to hire one support staff for those five megawatts. We're not going to go above that. We're not going to, you know, make sure that we increase our cost. We get, we keep that cash flow stable so that we can run through the bear and the bull markets. Yeah. And, and JP, I'm going to kind of throw a monkey wrench out here just for my personal curiosity. So let's just say I am new to Bitcoin or I'm experienced in Bitcoin, but I want to buy a miner. So I go out and I grab a, an ASIC S9 or something, for example, and I want to, you know, make some money, make some Satoshis, like on average, like, what do you think? I mean, and of course, there's tons of competition because you're competing against Riot and Marathon and all these different uh, people fighting for hash rate. But like when you first started, like how much were you making on like one or two miners or when your operation started to become like fully functional? Yeah. So when you're when you're mining Bitcoin, you're you're, you're getting paid based on the amount of terra hashes you're producing. And so when you're starting off early, you know, when we had the 300 mining facility, we were mining close to 500 Ethereum a day. And that was right when the Ethereum network was started. By the end of that operation, we were mining probably close to 50 Ethereum a month. So it shows you the degradation is pretty rapid when it comes to mining. And so when it comes to buying equipment, you want to get equipment that you know can uh, be profitable through multiple halving events. And S9 is great, but your power basically needs to be free or cheap at this point. I would suggest investing in a more efficient machine, buying not when everyone else wants it, but buying when it's a low in the market. Right after the halving is a great time to pick up equipment. People go bankrupt, people have to sell, people can't pay their power bills. Pick up some cheap equipment and plug it in and run it. The number one thing you don't want to do, though, is buy equipment and not have a space to put it. You want to make sure you're building out your rack space or have your space locked in to some sort of agreement or know someone who has space available for you. Because if you have machines that aren't running, they are paperweights. And every day they're not running, they are losing value. They're not able to extract Bitcoin for you. So for us, you know, we fluctuate all the way up to a million dollars in revenue, all the way down to, I think in this bear market, we got down to $200,000 a month in maybe $300,000 a month in revenue on just reoccurring. So that changes rapidly with the market dynamics. 
And uh, with the halving event, it's going to cut in half. And so that's why they're always putting out new capacity, always upgrading your fleet. Um, but my suggestion is, is it's all about timing. Look at this as a four-year cycle. Bitcoin has a halving cycle. It's natural. It's built in. The price, yes, it moves up 3 or 5%, down 10%. But focus on the long term here and focus on buying when there's you know blood on the ground and blood in the streets and sell when it's euphoric, when your grandma's talking to you about mining, when your parents like, oh, you in that Bitcoin again? You're like, okay, shit, what's happening? So let me take some money off the table, put in some cash and maybe you know buy some land for a future mining site or invest in transformers um, or just hold cash because it, it's okay to be in a cash position. I know we don't like it being you know Bitcoin maxi and we love in Bitcoin, but the amount of money you can make by just taking some money off the table during the Bitcoin uh, bull market and then reinvesting that two years later it, it's worth it every time last question for you jp so of course we're seeing like all these different changes in the regulatory landscape um, i'm sure mining will be impacted by that down the road you see um blackrock and some of these other companies trying to grab etfs they're going to be trying to grab as much bitcoin as possible um so like looking ahead at the future like what do you see mining going i know you talked about the halving like where like what's your game plan for 2024 when things start to change are you just gonna get rid of all your miners and try to grab the newest stuff to keep up with the speeds like what's your process with that so for us between now and the halving we're continuing to building out rack space because rack space is the number one asset when the price goes really fast as i mentioned miners are available but rack space is not because it takes a while to build this out and when also when everyone else wants to build in the supply chain it sucks up all the transformers and there's everything goes from like lead times for four weeks to lead times for 50 weeks. And so that makes it nearly impossible to manufacture and build at scale. So at Mining Store, we're focused on building those out. We're focused on getting hosting clients in, getting cash flow that's stable, letting someone else take that Bitcoin exposure, but also getting the right to buy those machines out of the contract when we do think it's a good time. And if we can't agree on a price or a market price like Luxor from the client so that we can own that hash rate ourselves. So like I said, it's really a risk on, risk off on the hash rate side while constantly building out new data centers, building our team, improving our efficiency, improving our processes, improving our infrastructure, and then improving our funnels of for sales and making sure that the client has a a great experience throughout the whole process and is communicated with. So that's where we're focused on, you know, during the bear market, like you said, is when the building happens. During the bull market, it's when the parties happen. It's when everyone runs around with a chicken with their head cut off. It's when you have so much stuff going on. You know, there's so many people wanting to deploy facilities, so many people wanting your time that it's just so hard to keep track of. But right now between that and the having, we're focused on getting the rack space built and then getting in a position to be able to buy more miners when we when I believe it's the best time. Yeah, during those bull markets, like people get so busy, even for me as a podcaster, like it's hard to get people on as guests. Everybody's moving, shaking, doing what they need to do. So I definitely agree with that. And uh, it's great to build right now because it's quiet. People aren't paying attention. And of course, underappreciated assets are always the winners. So this is the biggest one that you've ever seen in your lifetime. And I think people just need to really get on board with Bitcoin. So thank you, JP, man. This, this conversation has been awesome brother yep and before you go um i just want to make sure that people get your social media handles and any last words that you might want to let people know sure so my social media handle is at john paul barrick on instagram at jp barrick on tiktok we are at mining store on twitter and miningstore.com you can learn more about the the products we offer and learn more about bitcoin mining in general and see some videos pictures of our facility and what we've done in our case studies one thing I'll highlight is I'll never ask you for crypto. So there's a lot of scammers, you know, using social media and they'll message you and DM you. That's sorry. That's most likely not me talking to you. Um, if it is me, I'll tell you to get on a call with me and we can get on and talk face to face. And the scammers haven't got that good yet. So I'm still able to do this. But yeah, definitely. Um, and if you're interested in BitVault and you want to learn more about that, I will be launching my own BitVault for myself as an influencer in the coming months. So check that out. Um, and it's all the links in my bio for more information. But thanks again for having me. And remember to mine on. Thank you, JP, for joining us today. Once again, you know, I really appreciate you being on the Bitcoin source of Bitcoin conversation. Have a good one.